Lord Jesus, that is our prayer. And even as you taught your disciples to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on the earth. That is our eager expectation that you will return, that you will establish your reign on the earth as you promised. And until that day, Lord, let us be faithful with the proclamation of that great news that the king will return. And we just pray that you would use your word this evening in our hearts to enliven our hopes and our anticipation to that very thing. Make us useful in the time while you are away. And we ask it in your name. Amen. All right, I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles this evening to Daniel chapter 2 once again. And I want to begin our time this evening by way of introduction in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is, of course, the unfolding of the gospel's great commission from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. The book of Acts follows that very outline. And when we get to the end of the book of Acts, we're really beginning church history. And we have this statement about the Apostle Paul. We, we don't have the end of Paul's life here. We don't have the end of his journeys. We simply have this statement in Acts 28, 30. He stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Acts 1, of course, began with the kingdom. Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples, and his disciples asked him, is it now that you're going to establish the kingdom in Israel? And Jesus' answer was not, no, 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 you misunderstand. You're in the kingdom already. His answer was not, no, you misunderstand. The kingdom isn't for Israel. Uh, he didn't say, no, you misunderstand. Um, the, the kingdom as you thought is not going to be established. He said none of those things. He said, you're not to know the times. But for now, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when he comes, and you will preach the gospel, substitutionary atonement, to the ends of the earth. And that's the beginning of Acts. And the end of Acts, we have here Paul preaching the kingdom of God. And we might have expected the text to say, and so Paul kept going on preaching about forgiveness of sin to the Gentile world through the blood of Jesus. But included in Paul's message is this resounding theme, the kingdom of God. A reminder of Jesus' very words to his disciples in the upper room, pray this, <laughs> pray this, your kingdom come. That ought to be the prayer on the hearts and lips of every disciple, every follower of Jesus Christ. The king came, and he came as a suffering servant. And the king is returning, and he will keep his promises. And so we pray, Lord, we miss you. We want you here. We want your kingdom established. We want your will done on earth, even as it is consistently done in heaven. So come, come, Lord Jesus. The Bible ends. And we want to look back at Daniel chapter 2. We're here looking at Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And I want to remind us of the dream in Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 31. Daniel, of course, by God's direct revelation, was able to tell King Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was. He rehearses it in verse 31. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. You continued looking until the stone was struck. Uh, excuse me, you continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth." That was the dream. Next, Daniel gave its interpretation in verse 36. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. 
Wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. It will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. What we're looking at this evening is verses 44 and 45, the fifth kingdom, the final kingdom, kingdom come. And what we'll do this evening is divide our discussion in two parts. The first will be the descriptions of Messiah's kingdom. We'll look at eight descriptions of Messiah's kingdom in these verses. And then we'll talk about implications for Daniel's vision on systems of eschatology, that is systems of the way theologians view the end times. So let's start with the text itself and eight descriptions of human history's final kingdom. The first description is in verse 44. This kingdom will arrive at the last stage of human history. This first description of the kingdom is a description about when. When will this happen? The first phrase in verse 44 is about timing. Notice what Daniel reports. In the days of those kings. There's a time period coming where there is a series of kings and that time period is the time period when this last kingdom will come. Um, you, if you've ever wondered, when will Jesus return? Daniel doesn't give a date here. But he does give a time in terms of the phases of human history. This verse is about timing. If we go back to the vision itself in verse 34, we discover that the stone struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay. And in verse 42, we discover that there are toes of iron and clay on the feet. And as we talked about last week, the ten toes on the statue refer to the ten kings of Daniel chapter 7. There is a federation of kings in the fourth empire that has never yet existed. Uh, that is why we deal with a, a revival of the Roman Empire and a federation of kings under one head. We'll get to that in detail when we look at Daniel chapter 7 and the unfolding of the prophecy through the end of the book. But the ten toes of Daniel 2 are equivalent to the ten horns and the ten kings of Daniel 7 and following, and it is a federation of mixed kingdoms. As iron and clay don't mix, they're not like each other, but they have a common enemy. They have a common goal. Uh, they have a, a reason to try to work together. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 8 to 14, we find these ten horns and immediately after the ten horns or those ten, the federation of ten kings, it is at that point, according to Daniel 7, that this last kingdom comes. In other words, it is at the last stage of sinful human government that the rock missile projectile kingdom smashes Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And it smashes the statue at its feet. And the stone here is not sort of hunting for a weak link. Let me find a, a, a soft spot in the statue. Uh, I'm going I'm to look for the place where the, the iron and the clay are, are mixing and not adhering, and, and that's when I strike the statue. And if I hit it there, the whole thing will fall down. That is not the picture. This is not a picture about a weak spot. Uh, this is a demonstration of the timing 
The statue itself is a timeline. It, it's not as if the, the stone hurtling at the statue couldn't decimate it at the golden dome. This rock will decimate all of human governance. But the statue itself is a timeline, a timeline of empires. It is the progression of human kingdoms extending to the end of the times of the Gentiles. And we know that in the very language that Daniel uses to explain the dream. You, O Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. And after you, there will be another empire. And in succession of empires, all the way down through the fourth. And notice the stone does not strike Babylon. The stone doesn't hit Nebuchadnezzar. The fifth kingdom does not establish itself in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. It doesn't strike the Medo-Persian Empire at the silver level. It doesn't strike the Grecian Empire at the bronze level. It doesn't strike Rome at the solid iron level. Instead, the stone comes at the feet and the toes where the iron and clay are mixed. Nebuchadnezzar's dream tells us when the final kingdom will come, not by a date, but by a phase in the history of human governance, a phase that was future from Daniel's perspective and a date which is still future from our own. Second description of the kingdom here in the vision is that this kingdom will be established directly by God. This kingdom will be established directly by God. Notice verse 44, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom. This is the stone cut out without hands, that is without human implements, without human work, without human labor. This kingdom is not man-made. This kingdom is not built by people. This is work not done by mere humans. Who sets up this kingdom? God sets up this kingdom. And, and what's critical to understand is this is, not, this is a contrast to the other kingdoms. And it is appropriate to understand from a God's sovereignty perspective that God did set up all the other kingdoms. God is in charge of when kings rise and when they fall, when empires rise up and when they go down. God is in charge sovereignly of all of those things. He indeed is the king of all kings. He's working out his, his plan in meticulous detail. But this is different. This fifth kingdom in the order of kingdoms here in Daniel 2 is directly established by God, not by means, not by his sovereign hand over human labors, this is a stone cut out without hands, and it is the God of heaven who sets up this kingdom. This is not of man at all. This is totally of God. This fifth kingdom comes from heaven. It is authored by the God of heaven. A third description of the kingdom. This kingdom will not self-destruct. Look at verse 44. It is a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And the English here doesn't capture the reflexive verb in the original, which gives the meaning that into eternity, never will this kingdom be destroying itself. That is the flavor of the original. It is, in other words, this kingdom is not fatally flawed. This kingdom does not have a self-destruct button. All human kingdoms are doomed from their inception. They are all temporary. They are all programmed to self-destruct. You might think that planned obsolescence is an invention of the Apple company uh, or of some car maker. We really need to get you in a new, into a new model soon, so uh, we plan some things to break down over time. Um, that is not so. Um, human governments break down uh, of, of their own making. They, they break down because they are human. They are all temporary. Republics give way to tyranny. Tyrants are overthrown by revolution or military coup. Revolutions give way to bureaucracies or some other tyrant or maybe an experiment with a democracy. Democracy gives way to corruption. Corruption demands a problem solver with centralized power and we're back to tyranny again. It was Alexis de Tocqueville who was living in France as a political philosopher in the days of French Revolution, 
In 1831, he toured the United States for some nine months and he figured out the Achilles heel in the American experiment. He said, look, what you guys have done over here is great. <laughs> Hope it works out for you. Uh, but as he analyzed the American democratic system, he realized that as soon as the majority, as soon as 51% figure out that they can line their own pockets with other people's money simply by voting, then the experiment's over. He wrote that in his paper in 1835 in a report back to France. In, in the last decade, we've actually seen that happen. And, and while the experiment that, that we've enjoyed was fatally flawed from the beginning, and it was so because we're a bunch of sinners living together, um, it, it has been a nice ride. It, it can't live forever. The problem with human governance is that all human endeavor is inherently problematic. And human endeavor is problematic in this world at this time for three primary reasons. Number one is human sin. Number two is satanic rule. He is called the God of this world and he blinds the minds of unbelievers. He is actively opposed to God and his ways. And number three, because of God's curse. Man's labor is cursed, the earth is cursed by God. Ecclesiastes 7 said that God has bent the universe and who can straighten it out? Nobody but God. And there is really no hope for human government to get these things right. Kingdom come, however, or the fifth kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's statue dream isn't from around here. It's not subject to human depravity. It is certainly not under Satan's dominion nor the curse of God. It, it has no self-destructive tendencies. It has no Achilles heel. There's no fatal flaw in its philosophy of politic. A fourth description of this kingdom. This kingdom will have no successor. Look again at verse 44. It will not be left for another people. There are no rivals to this kingdom. No replacements, there's, there's no doubt uh, about this kingdom. When this kingdom is on the earth, nobody, be, nobody, be, we, nobody will be looking out on the political horizon and saying, oh man, something else is coming. My great grandfather used to see a clear blue sky from horizon to horizon, one little puffball cloud way out on the edge and he would say, clouding up, looks like rain. There is no future empire looming on the horizon in some small puffball cloud for this kingdom to fear. It will not leave itself to some other people, like the Assyrians left all their stuff to the Babylonians, and the Babylonians left all their stuff to the Medes and the Persians, and the Medes and the Persians left all their stuff to the Greeks, and the Greeks left all their stuff to the Romans. There will not be a successor to this empire. When Babylon took over from Assyria, Assyria had been untouchable. And, and, and there were the Egyptians out in the, distant, uh, in the distance, but the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians soundly, took over for the Assyrians. And, and there was always somebody looming on the horizon. I believe this is why Nebuchadnezzar couldn't sleep, went to bed thinking about what's gonna be in the future. He himself had taken down an empire. There were potential rivals everywhere and he watched his father die. What's gonna to happen to me? And God answered. Your football team might be great this year, but another team is rising. Another team might be rising in your own division how long can a sports dynasty last? Athletes get old, other teams figure out your schemes. Who's coming up in the draft? There's always a successor. And this final kingdom in Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's vision has no successor. Nothing looming on the horizon. I wanna take you to the book of Revelation for a moment. We'll fast forward this a little bit. And you might be thinking, well, wait a second. There, 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 is a, there is a rival. 
I mean, if, if the earthly kingdom of Messiah is portrayed in Revelation chapter 20, where Christ reigns on the earth for a thousand years and Satan is subjugated to prison, he's got a big chain around his neck and he's kept down in the abyss so that he's not allowed to deceive the nations for that time. When we get to verse seven of Revelation 20, we find that the thousand years get completed. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, will come out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. And the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Wait, isn't this a rival empire? Isn't this something looming on the horizon that's some threat to this kingdom? I don't think that's the picture here at all. I, I do believe that sinful humanity, we're not in the eternal state yet in Revelation 20. That doesn't come till Revelation 21, which clearly says then there was a new heavens and new earth. But this is the present earth and the future reign of Christ on that earth. And there are sinners, mortals, on the earth during that time. And can you imagine what it would be like to be there, to see Christ personally reigning, ruling the nations with a rod of iron from his throne in Jerusalem, and yet people rebelling against him at the heart level, rooting for the underdog that's in jail. Maybe when he gets out, I'll be in league with him and I'll make war against the holy city and against King Jesus. What audacity. <laughs> That is not a statement about, oh, there's a rival empire and maybe a successor. That just tells us how bad the human heart is. With Satan locked up, Jesus culture ruling the world, I mean, that's as good as it's gonna get. The only enemy left to a believer is the human heart, and the human heart is that bad that it would side with Satan against Christ during the best period of human history. But it's no rival. Look what happens in verse nine. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Game over, man. There, there's no war. They gathered together for the war. Fire done over. This fifth kingdom has no successors. That's thrilling. The fifth description. This kingdom will terminate sinful human governance. Verse 44, it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. Literally, it will cause them to be shattered and remain in a shattered state. Just done. No picking up the pieces and the, and the crumbs of human governments. Nobody's reading Plato's Republic and trying to remake it. Let's do that again. It's just all over. This brings to a final end sinful human governance. And notice I didn't say it brings to an end human governance. Why? Because the king reigning during this time on the earth will be fully human, just not a sinner. He'll also be fully God. He is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the conquering king. He's coming and he will reign and he'll smash all sinful human governance and his saints will reign with him. There will be human governance. There will be human lordship as was outlined in Genesis as is sung about in Psalm 8, as is promised in Hebrews 2, that's all coming. It just won't be sinful. Messiah will reign. Description number six in verse 44, this kingdom will have no end. Very clearly, it will put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. This kingdom is eternal. Literally, it will rise unto forever. This is, a, this is an earthly kingdom that will have no end. And you say, well, wait a second. I thought you just said Revelation 20 and, and it lasts a thousand years. Yes, this is an earthly reign that transcends the existence of the present heavens and earth. That is the, the pre space, the universe, and this terrestrial globe. The reign of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, begins with the smashing of the statue and never ends, even through the creation of a new heavens and new earth. There are significant discontinuities between Messiah's earthly reign and the eternal state. In Messiah's earthly reign, there will be sinners that 
need to be ruled with a rod of iron. There will be enemies who feign obedience. There will be mortality. That is, one who lives to 100 years old, Isaiah says, will be considered but a babe, but a youth. There will be mortality. There will be sinners. Uh, there will be uh, residual effects of sin and death and the curse. But they will be so ameliorated by Jesus' reign on the earth that it will be the high time of human history, really the golden age of all that humans have ever experienced. And so there is not only discontinuities between the reign of Messiah on the earth and the eternal state, there are also continuities. <laughs> that is, Jesus' reign never ends. The kingdom he receives from his Father will go on and on and on forever into eternity. We'll talk more about that. Number seven, this will be Messiah's kingdom. Verse 45. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. You don't see the word Messiah in this verse, but you do see it when this is repeated in Daniel chapter 7. Now, you don't see Jesus' name here, you don't see the word Messiah, but look at Daniel chapter 7. After the description of the fourth beast of Daniel 7, which corresponds to the fourth empire and the statue in Daniel 2, Daniel relates in verse 12 of chapter 7, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him, that is to the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Here you have the identification of the stone in Daniel chapter 2 as the Son of Man presented before the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7. And the timeline is the same. All other kingdoms come to an end. This kingdom begins and never ends. And it belongs to this one called the Son of Man. In chapter 7, verse 18, we read, The saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. That is, those set apart by God unto his purposes. This includes all believers. And then verse 27, Then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. That is this kingdom. <clears throat> In Isaiah chapter 2, we read this, in the last days the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. In Micah 4, we read the same words, in the last days the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains, raised above the hills, the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of Yahweh and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. They will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will send under his, under his vine and under his fig tree, with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of Yahweh of hosts has spoken." You see, there's a day coming when this mountain will be in place and there will be world peace and righteous judgments. Isaiah 8.14 describes God himself as a striking stone and a stumbling stone. Isaiah 28.16 says that God will place in Zion a precious stone and a chief cornerstone. Psalm 118 tells us that the builders will reject that cornerstone in Matthew 21, 42, Jesus himself is identified as the rejected stone and the chief cornerstone. 
In Romans 9.33, he is called a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, particularly to Israel. In 1 Peter 2, he is the precious choice cornerstone, and belief in him is security. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, Jesus is called the foundation stone. There really are no commentators that disagree with the identification of this stone striking the statue as Messiah. Even Jewish commentators assert that the final kingdom here in Daniel 2 is the kingdom of Messiah. There really are no alternative interpretations worth mentioning seriously. Um, I will mention a couple unseriously. (laughs) Early British Zionism, you remember the Balfour Declaration? All the attempts in in Britain to establish a modern state of Israel. Pardon me. There's a granule of stumbling in my throat. throat) Early British Zionism said that the stone is the British Empire. (laughs) That was bold. Um, One man who happened to be a Baptist said the stone is the Baptist church. What's going to smash all the evil governments of the world? The Baptist church. Listen to Luke chapter 20. Jesus looked at them and said, What then is it that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And do you see what Jesus just did in identifying himself with both Psalm 118 and with Daniel 2? (laughs) He's the stone. And and he will come and he will crush. Crush all these things to powder. Scatter them like dust. So that leads us to an eighth description in verse 45. This kingdom will be cataclysmically victorious. It crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. This is a pretty dramatic picture. Its import ought to be obvious. The statue will be gone. When the stone strikes the statue, the statue ceases to exist. There's no statue left. It it becomes powder dispersed as by the summer breeze. And then if we go back to the dream itself, back in verse 35, another statement is given. The wind carried away like the chaff from the summer threshing floors. Not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 35 makes it clear that this kingdom will fill the whole earth. As Nathaniel West has said, this is the world-embracing, universal, indestructible, and everlasting kingdom of Christ, set up in victory on this present earth, on the ruins of all existing governments, in the last days of the last kingdoms into which the old Roman territory will be divided. Those are the eight descriptions of this fifth kingdom in two verses. I want to spend some time this evening thinking through implications for systems of eschatology. There are different ways that theologians think about the end times. How will it all go down? And really, systems of eschatology um, can emerge in a number of, two, a number of ways. You, you can view the various theological perspectives on end times, and you can say, hmm, I like that one. Boy, that one would be great. That's a great plan. That one fits my worldview or the way that I think. That one allows me to make some really remarkable financial investments. <laughs> and, and there are people that draw up schemes revolving around their favorite eschatological system. But really, the way we ought to draw out eschatology is exegetically, that is, from the Bible. What does the Bible say? And, and any eschatological system has to withstand the test of every single verse in the Bible. When we think about eschatology, we have to think about it like every other flavor of theology, every other angle of theology, every other part of theology. If we talk about the love of God, we have to talk about the love of God in a way that withstands the test of every single verse in the Bible about God's love and about all of his other attributes. And when we talk about 
a system of end times, we have to talk about something that can withstand the test of every verse of the Bible. By the way, if a Bible verse strikes down the monolith of our eschatology, then our eschatology uh, goes away, like chaff in the summer breeze. It just must. Why? Because the Bible wins over systems. So don't pick your favorite system because you like the system. Don't pick your favorite system because of its adherents happen to be your heroes. But what does the Bible say? And let that, over time, carefully fill out what you believe about end times, just like every other part of theology. When we talk about the kingdom, we need to think very carefully and not just give sort of a a flat definition to the idea of God's kingly reign, as if the Bible could only speak of one thing. We don't plug one definition of the kingly reign of God into every aspect of where God's sovereignty exists. The words king and the verb form of the word king, which is to reign in English, they're different words, but in in Hebrew and in Greek, uh, a king, kings. Uh, They are related. And those themes are all over the Bible. For instance, the, the kingly reign of God manifests itself in various ways at different times. The kingdom that is predicted here is not present when Daniel writes. We understand that from what, what Daniel is saying here. He's talking about a future kingdom sometime after Nebuchadnezzar, sometime after the empire after Nebuchadnezzar, sometime after the empire after the empire after Nebuchadnezzar. That's very clear from this text. And so whatever the kingdom of God Daniel is talking about in this verse, it's not the sense in which God reigned presently when Daniel wrote it. Do you understand? There is a a sovereignty of God that existed when Daniel wrote. It's not as if God was off his throne when God predicted a future kingdom. So we can't make the idea of kingdom just simply be God's in charge. Well, of course it's true. God's always been in charge. But if the God who is in charge says there will be a kingdom, then he means something distinct from simple sovereignty. The kingdom that is predicted is not present when Daniel writes. Whatever that kingdom is, it hasn't happened yet. As Alva J. McLean uh, identifies in his book, The Greatness of the Kingdom, There are various aspects to God's kingly reign. He describes the universal kingdom of God, which is just God's sovereign reign over all things at all times. And then he describes the mediatorial kingdom of God. That is, God rules through means, through mediation and representation. God has his man on the earth. And that can be seen in various forms, through Adam, um, through others, through the patriarchs, but particularly in the theocratic governance of Israel. How was God king over Israel? Uh, From Moses to Saul, it was different than it was during the monarchy. Uh, From Saul, David, and Solomon. And then it was different as as the monarchy declined through division and, and ultimately the end of kings in Israel and Judah. Alva J. McLean also identifies the spiritual rulership of God over his people through faith at the heart level. That's always true, Old Testament, New Testament. God is king and he's my king. And he's my king from the heart. By the way, it's much better to be God's subject willingly while you're still breathing here now and have him be your king than to show up when he's reigning on the earth and have to feign obedience or worse, to show up in his very presence when the books are opened, when your rebellion is unstoppable, unchangeable. And then McLean identifies, in addition to the universal kingdom of God, the mediatorial kingdom of God through rulers and the spiritual rule of God in the hearts of believers, he also identifies the coming earthly kingdom of Messiah on the earth promised in detail in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so we don't just flatten out the word kingdom when we're talking about the kingdom. We don't just make it one thing. We let texts of scripture tell us what those texts of scripture are talking about when they talk about kingdom. And when we come to Daniel chapter two, if the details may be allowed to speak, and I believe they should speak, then Nebuchadnezzar's dream disallows any view of the kingdom of the Messiah that has the kingdoms of the earth still standing when Messiah's kingdom is here. The the statue dream disallows that view. If the details of the statue dream 
stand. What I want to do is just talk about systems that take different approaches to the timing of the kingdom, the timing of the millennial kingdom. And these descriptions, these definitions are necessarily truncated. They're, they're short. I'm going to try to give you summary statements. So you have a handle on things. Uh, I don't want to give a pejorative label to any of these. I, I, I've, I've tried to represent three views in particular according to the ways their adherents would say them, um, just in an attempt um, to be fair. Although brevity is unfair. We recognize that. I'm not going to... Um, we're just not going to spend days and weeks and years that it would take to read all the material on any one of these views. When we talk about a millennium, the word millennium simply means a thousand years. I, I bothered Merriam-Webster a little bit this week just to double check my work. Here's Merriam-Webster's uh, definitions. This is the 2021 official Merriam-Webster dictionary. Definition number one in Merriam-Webster is, of millennium, is... The thousand years mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, during which holiness is to prevail and Christ is to reign on the earth. I thought, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> that was definition number one. Uh, that was 1A. 1B is a period of great happiness or human perfection. Okay, what does a millennium mean? A period of great happiness or human perfection. Definition number two, a period of 1,000 years. Or... Uh, to be a thousandth anniversary or its celebration. This is the millennium. The, the, you're celebrating a thousand years of something. Of course, a millennial, well, we won't get into what a millennial is. <laughs> it's someone who's only ever lived in this millennium. We'll just leave it at that. that see, my inner curmudgeon just came out. Millennials are great. And we have to leave the world to you. Okay. Okay. Um, Pre-mill, I have some in my house, by the way. I love them. They're great. Pre-mill, we're, we're just, I, I can't, I tried to say premillennialism several times last week, and I just can't say it over and over again. So we're just going to say pre-mill for short. It's a nickname, okay? Um, what we mean by pre-mill is that the kingdom will come when Christ returns. That is, Christ comes back pre thousand years, pre-millennium. Okay, that's pre-mill. Christ comes back before the kingdom is here. Uh, he brings in the kingdom. Uh, Amil, short for amillennialism, um, means we are in the kingdom now. And, and even though the, the amillennialism starts with a little A at the front of something that negates a word, like moral, and then amoral, or uh, to muse means to think, but an amusement park is a place where you go and chuck your brain out the door. Um, amillennial, if you talk to an amillennial, they don't mean there's no kingdom, right? That, that's an unfortunate pejorative. Don't run up to your amillennial friend and say, you don't believe in the kingdom. They're going to say, no, of course I believe in the kingdom. I'm in the kingdom right now. Okay, it doesn't mean no kingdom. It just means that the kingdom is present. They, they mean that we're in it. Uh, they mean that the kingdom is synonymous either with the church, the church is the kingdom, or the kingdom of God is the invisible work of God through the gospel in the hearts of his people. There's not a thousand year reign to look forward to. Um, there's not an, uh, something, some other earthly kingdom to look forward to in the future. This is it, and Christ comes back after this. This is the reason that uh, amillennials will often talk of themselves or be spoken of by others as post-millennial. That's going to be confusing. I shouldn't have said that out loud. I'm so sorry. Just stick with Amil. Um, and the start date for the kingdom, if you're Amil, is nearly as varied as the authors you look for. Um, some would put the start date at the birth of Jesus. Some would put the start date at the death, burial, uh, resurrection event of Jesus. Some would put the start date at Acts 2 and Pentecost. Some would put the start date at something like the Edict of Milan in 311 AD when Christians were no longer allowed to be persecuted or 325 AD at the Council of Constantine when you had significant uh, state church involvement in theological decisions or even two emperors after Constantine when the Roman Empire became recognized officially as a Christian empire. Any of those dates are suggested as the start of the kingdom in, a, in an amillennial perspective. 
And the, but the main idea is we're in it now. And, and for many years, people held to a little, literal thousand year reign in amillennialism. They said, well, the start date, if it's 325, we're gonna make it to 1325, and then Jesus comes back and it's the eternal state. Um, there are reasons why the literal approach to a thousand years have been dropped through church history. Uh, post-millennialism, are you still with me? Post-mill, for short, um, is the idea that Christ comes back after the kingdom. So it's like Amil in that Christ comes back after the kingdom. Amil says we're in the kingdom now. Post-mill says the kingdom's still coming and Christ returns after it. What is the kingdom in post-mill? Um, it is what the church builds. Uh, the idea behind post-mill is we, we build the kingdom. Christ returns after we've established his kingdom on the earth. And, 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 and good post-mill guys would say God is the one establishing it, but he uses means. He's using us to do it in, in one of two ways, either by gospel proclamation and missions, heart transformation. When the gospel mission is accomplished and the world believes the gospel, humanity will very naturally experience a golden age of peace and prosperity. And when all of that is in place, Christ will return, end history, and usher in the new heavens, new earth, eternal state. That's one way that post-mill happens where we build the kingdom by missions and gospel proclamation. The second way that post-mills think about it is uh, called reconstructionism. That is the growth and strengthening of the church state where Old Testament case law becomes statutory jurisprudence of the world. It doesn't mean everybody has to be a believer. It just means that God's law is the rule of society across the globe. How do we get there? Well, there is the call for Christians to be involved in governments, politics, education, the arts, other culture-shaping industries to bring about the kingdom of Christ on the earth. After we have established that global church-state kingdom and enjoyed a golden age of humanity under it, then Christ will return, close up all history, and usher in the new heavens and new earth eternal state. How do, all, how do these three views, and I haven't drawn out the subdivisions of those three views. You may be wondering why I didn't mention some of them. Um, that's for another time. Those are the kind of three major things. And, the, and those are the three views that are affected by Nebuchadnezzar's dream statue. According to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, if you're Amil, the fifth and final kingdom, Daniel 2, 44 and 45, is the invisible spiritual reign of Christ in the hearts of believers that began at Christ's first coming. If you're post-mill, the fifth and final kingdom of Daniel 2 is the invisible spiritual reign of Christ in the hearts of believers, beginning at Christ's first coming, but growing into the golden age of human history as the gospel spreads or as Old Testament law governs the world. If you're pre-mill, uh, the fifth and final kingdom is still future. It didn't start at Christ's coming. It starts when Christ returns. So we're gonna lump post-mill and ah-mill together when we think about Daniel 2, because both of them have Christ returning after the kingdom. They simply define the kingdom differently. Is it the church in its present form, or is it the golden age of the church when she will rule the earth? That's the difference. But the way they explain Daniel 2 is the same. So we'll lump these together. I'll give you just a few representative examples of how, how do they explain Daniel 2. Uh, the first mode of explanation is simply, well, don't pay attention to the details. The details aren't important. You just need to get the big idea. And so here's one example. The vision of Daniel 2 does not intend to be precise. Though it starts in the concrete present, it's a wrong strategy to proceed through history and associate the different stages of the statue with particular empires. The vision intends to convey something more general, but also more grand, that God is sovereign. He's in control no matter what the present looks like. Calvin similarly said, Daniel is not relating to what was going to be completed in one moment. He just wants to teach that the kingdoms of the world are transient and there's only one eternal kingdom. So that's one approach. Ignore the details. The general idea is all that matters. The second approach is, well, let's explain the details. And I'll give you an example. Quote, the progress of the hidden kingdom of Christ, which presses in on our present world from beyond, with powerful and even devastating effects on the things that happen around us. He is the precious cornerstone which much, must define the shape of it, fill the supreme place within all earthly empire building. And woe to the foolish builders if they allow themselves to be tempted to reject him in order to fulfill other plans. 
With his first coming, he has brought in his kingdom in full reality. The idea is the kingdom, the stone cut out of the mountain that smashes the statue, has already come. So then what is the statue? This theologian says the statue can represent a number of things. What is worst in the best of almost everything in the political and cultural world. It can represent the Greek Empire, Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic Church, Napoleon's Empire, British imperialism, Hitler's Empire. It can be a warning to American capitalism or Russian communism. It can stand for any system that tends to close itself to the living influence of the spirit of Jesus Christ. It can tell us all plainly what lies in our future too if we stand in the way of the progress of the word of God by which he rules. So the kingdom of God has come. The statue represents anything that doesn't conform to his kingdom. What does the statue's demolition signify? Quote, his kingdom is bound to gather momentum and grow in hidden force and hidden power. All that cannot be taken up and incorporated into it will ultimately be shown up as vanity, as chaff that the wind blows away, end quote. So the statue ought to give way. If you're part of that statue, you need to, you need to stop opposing the kingdom of God because if you don't, then you're just gonna have to realize that it's all valueless. So naturally, the statue represents more than geopolitical empires. Whatever opposes the rule of God in our own lives is part of that statue. Quote, it can stand for our little empires, domestic, social, business, financial, or ecclesiastical, in the midst of which some of us sit enthroned, trying in vain to find security and satisfaction. It can stand merely for the image of our own future. That is the, that is the approach of sorting out the details of the statue as applied to post-mill or amill. Let's just make some observations for a moment about the statue. The first coming of Christ is nowhere symbolized in the statue. It's not there. Suffering servant, babe in a manger, those things aren't there. A different image is given. Daniel will get very specific in his prediction of the first coming of Christ in chapter nine. Surprisingly, remarkably specific. But the birth of Christ is not here in Daniel 2. The statue is demolished. It's not still standing. It's not gradually altered. And notice where the statue is struck. It's struck at the head. It's not struck at the head, Babylon, or the chest, Medo-Persia, or the waist, Greece. It's not struck at the legs, solid iron Rome. It's struck at Rome 2.0. It's struck at the feet and the toes. Caesar Augustus and solid iron Rome was the empire in place when Christ came. The stone didn't come at the hips or the knees. The stone came later. It came at a tenfold division of a Roman empire that is still future. And notice verse 35, uh, the, the stone fills the whole earth after the statue is struck, after the statue is crushed, turned to powder, and blown away. Some would argue that filling the whole earth indicates a progress and growth and a slow process rather than an instantaneous world empire. Well, look, verse 35, the, the stone growing does indicate a process, but that process happens after the statue is demolished. What the stone does after it catastrophically removes the statue from existence is fill the whole earth. This, by the way, fits Revelation 19 and 20 in chronological order and the progression there. Uh, the, Christ comes, he destroys, and then he fills. It fits what we will see in Daniel 12, and Daniel will get much more specific. So in the, in the post-mill, ah-mill views, you have the rock arriving, but the statue still standing. Uh, the rock has arrived invisibly, uh, spiritually. The kingdom of Messiah is filling the earth while the, the statue is still in place. In what sense could the statue be said to have been destroyed or, or being destroyed over, for instance, the last 2,000 years? Now, the statue is still very much in place. The kingdom did not come at the incarnation at solid iron Rome, according to Daniel 2. The fourth empire is divided, not just in terms of materials, but also in terms of time. Remember, as you work your way down the statue, you're dealing with a, a timeline of phases of empires. And solid Rome happens before mixed materials in a later phase. 
Daniel 2 actually tells us when the kingdom will come. The details here present a serious problem for a view that says the statue is still standing and the kingdom is here. If the details are allowed to speak. By the way, what happened when the stone came at, at the knees, at solid Rome? What happened when Christ came the first time? We, we read last week in Luke that Caesar Augustus took a census. And the king of kings was born in a cave with animals. And the son of man had no place to lay his head. And, and the stone, which would become the chief cornerstone and the stone that would pulverize human governance, was crucified on a Roman cross. Who struck whom at the first incarnation, at the first coming of Christ? Christ was smote. He described himself in terms of Psalm 118 and Daniel 2 as the stone which the builders rejected who would come one day and pulverize all those who reject him. When he comes again, he will not be crucified by Rome. He will demolish Rome 2.0. He will bring an end to all sinful human civilization. Nathaniel West has described this not as a smooth, gentle, evangelical, and peaceful rubbing, but perpendicular fracture, pulverization, judicial grinding, atomization, an attending wind of judgment, blowing the chaff, dust, and powder of all Gentile politics so far out of sight as never to be seen anymore. He truly is King of kings and Lord of lords, and when he comes again, there will be no mistake. I want you to turn to Psalm 2, and as you're turning there, I think I have time to tell you about, I don't have time to tell you about Queen Victoria, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, Handel's Messiah was playing at Crystal Palace, and she, the Queen of England, um, was bound by royal English custom to remain seated in all her regality, and the hoi polloi of the people would stand up and sit down at all the appropriate places. Handel's Messiah gets to the Hallelujah Chorus, and everybody stands up, and Queen Victoria, contrary to English custom, stood. Why did she stand? Monarch though she was, she loved the King of Kings and spontaneously, impulsively rose to honor King Jesus. We need to do that while we're alive. Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why are the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I install my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. The very ends of the earth is your possession. You will break them or rule them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we would take refuge in you, our rock. May you not be a stone of stumbling to any in this room, but a rock of refuge we long for the day when you will be the missile projectile rock that pulverizes all sinful human civilization. We long for that day and we pray with all your disciples, your kingdom come. Amen. You are dismissed.